Well, OK, welcome, everyone. I think that we are uh, going to get underway and we are recording our session. So um, a big welcome to our CIPD webinar on creating menopause supportive workplaces. And um, we're holding this during Menopause Awareness Month. Um, so in today's discussion, we're going to explore how to create a menopause friendly work environment and how to empower employees to continue to work and thrive whilst experiencing menopause transition. Um, I'm Claire McCartney and I sit within our public policy team at the CIPD um, and alongside my colleague Rachel, who is on our webinar today, we lead our work at the CIPD on menopause. So I'm really delighted to be your chair for today and I am very much looking forward to our discussion. So we have some really great panellists lined up for our discussion today, including Rachel Suff, who is our Senior Policy Advisor for Employee Relations at the CIPD. We're also delighted to have Helen Tomlinson with us today, who is the UK Government's Menopause Employment Champion and is also Head of Talent the UK and Ireland at the ADECO Group and we are really um, excited to be collaborating with Helen to raise the profile of menopause support at work and we're also really happy to have Angie Voidless with us today who is Diversity and Inclusion Manager at Associated British Foods and we're really looking forward to hearing all about the, the work that Angie's doing um, around menopause support. So please do get your questions into our panel um, as they speak and we have reserved some time at the end of the webinar to answer as many of these as we can so we'll get into get into your questions and get into that discussion. Um, I'd like to just do a little bit of housekeeping if I may just to start off with so just to let you know this session is being uh, recorded and will be available on demand through the webinar section of the CIPD website. Um, to submit questions to the panel, please do type these into the Q&A box, um, not the chat box, which we're not going to be checking. Um, in terms of resources, we've got some um, practical guidance for HR and for people managers on uh, menopause support, which you can find on our website. So please do take a look at that um, after the webinar if you're interested. Um, CIPD members can get individual legal advice, so you can call our HR Inform Helpline and it's available 24-7. Also, CIPD members in UK and Ireland can also access our Wellbeing Hub and Helpline. Together with award-winning workplace wellbeing provider Health Assured, we provide CIPD members with free help and support 24-7 and 365 days a year via telephone or online consultations with qualified therapists. Members can access the phone number and the online services via the membership benefits webpage. Um, and we'll say a little bit more about that at the end of the session as well. So before I hand you over to our first panelists, I'd like to just say a little bit about our menopause work at the CIPD. Now, it's an area that we um, started to focus on back in 2018, actually, and we recognised that there was a substantial gap in workplace support and guidance and also a considerable taboo around talking about menopause experiences. At that time, actually, according to our data, less than one in 10 organisations had any kind of support in place. So we launched a menopause man manifesto in Westminster, um, calling, among other things, for a, a menopause employment champion. And we are so delighted that we have Helen and she is trailblazing um, in terms of what she's doing around menopause support. Um, we also launched just yesterday a new um, wide reaching survey on um, women's experience of menopause in the workplace. And Rachel is going to be outlining those um, details um, this afternoon in further detail. And at a policy level, we've been invited to give evidence to two parliamentary inquiries on the menopause, one by the all-party parliamentary group on menopause, and the second was the Women and Equality Select Committee. And we're really encouraged to see the current parliament spotlight on this issue. We've also been part of a, a 50 plus choices task and finish group on the menopause, and Rachel's been involved in um, an NHS steering group to improve menopause support in NHS England, which is really important. 
So we know that many employers have made progress with supporting um, women with menopause symptoms at work and our latest figure um, suggests this is certainly the case. I'm not going to steal Rachel's thunder by giving you the figure, but it's certainly increased. But we know that this isn't necessarily the case across the board and more can certainly be done to create a supportive culture. Um, and certainly in recent weeks, we've seen some high profile employment tribunal cases. And I think this really further highlights the importance of employers getting their support right when it comes to creating menopause friendly workplaces. So what more should organisations be doing to create a menopause supportive workplace and empower employees to manage their symptoms and thrive in the workplace? So I'm going to hand over now to our first panellist, which is Rachel Sutt, um, to share some insights from our new survey and discuss these in a little bit more detail. So over to you, Rachel. Thanks so much, Claire. So on, our, on my first slide, you can see that I'm going to start with the good news. And Claire's absolutely right. We are seeing real progress in terms of the number of organisations that are supporting people with menopause transition. And if you look, first of all, at the chart on the right hand side, and these are findings from our Health and Wellbeing at Work survey report, with Simply Health that we published just last week. So this is the first bit of research showing that progress. But you can see on that right hand side, the slide um, shows that almost half, 46% of HR professionals say that their wellbeing activity includes provision for menopause transition. That activity could be policy, training, line manager guidance, awareness raising, so quite broad. But the important thing to note is that when we asked that same question four years ago, it was just under one in 10. So what that means is that we've seen a four fold increase in four years, and that's remarkable progress. And then on the left hand side, you can see in that pie chart, when we asked does your organisation encourage an open and supportive climate where people can talk about menopause? You can see that the finding is even higher. 49% said yes. And it's really important to look at those two findings together because what we want is a holistic approach, a policy, training, awareness raising. All those are very important and can all play their part in creating supportive workplaces around menopause transition, but it also has to focus on the culture, as Claire mentioned. We need to have workplaces where people can talk about menopause, and I'll return to that important point later on. But on the next slide, just a question, where does this lead us in terms of what we've achieved, and where do we need to go next? What more is needed? Because our work isn't done yet. Claire's mentioned how much we welcome the government action that's been taken so far to create menopause friendly workplaces. We're delighted to be collaborating with Helen to build on the work that's been done so far. And we really do believe now at CIPD that the increased public policy focus and the employer action that we're seeing means that we're in a really good place now. The foundations are there, we think, to create a future where every employee with menopause symptoms can receive understanding and support because that's our ultimate aim. We want every employee to feel that they, they can talk about menopause and get that support. And that's the message that really uh, highlight, that is highlighted in our manifesto for menopause at work. So if we move on to the next slide, here comes the but really, because great progress, but this is not the time to relax, quite the opposite, because we have a very clear picture now of what's possible, because we've seen such great progress, but we need to close the gap completely and make sure that we can achieve that vision of every employee in every workplace. Now. This brings us on to the research that we published just this week, 
and it's on the experiences of women in employment. Around 2000, we surveyed in the UK about their experiences of menopause and work. And there are some really impactful findings. It's a very diverse sample that we reached as well. So the first finding really is that um, just one in four, despite all that progress I've just mentioned, just one in four are aware of their employer having any provision for menopause which means that even if the support is there, and it very well might be in some of those organisations, organisations need to get much better at communicating, being proactive, sharing the support, signposting, and so on. Because this gap still exists, and we need to now be intent on closing it. So on the next slide, I highlight a really big impact in terms of that gap. And this impact is on career progression. Now, if people at work, women at work, aren't able to realise their full potential, that doesn't just affect the individuals, it very much affects the individual, but it's also going to have an impact on the organisation as well. At a time that organisations cannot afford not to be making the most of all their skills and talent. But we can see here that a standout finding is that over a quarter of women in work with symptoms of menopause say they have had a negative impact on their career progression. Now, if you scale that up um, in terms of the findings across the UK labour market, that's around 1.2 million women in work. And that's hu a huge number. But also it's not just about the numbers be because behind these numbers sit the experiences of real people who are living with the reality of not achieving their career aspirations through a lack of support for what is a natural life event. And this just isn't right. And these stories, these experiences were really brought home to us through all the individual uh, stories and all of the feedback that we, we had from our survey respondents. And some of those stories were really hard hitting. Some of them were heartbreaking actually. And I've put one example up here and I'll read it out. But somebody told us that I've been unwilling, I've been unable, sorry, to continue a career which I developed over a period of 25 plus years due to being unsupported with symptoms of brain fog, extreme fatigue, mood swings, stress. And this has led to me having to take part time, low paid work. And there were other hard hitting experiences like that as well. And if we move on to the next slide, we can appreciate some of the wider impacts as well in terms of that gap. What does that mean in reality for people at work today? Well, almost one in four had considered leaving work or have left work due to a lack of support for their menopause symptoms. And let's be mindful of those uh, in tri employment tribunals that Claire mentioned as well. They're a real warning bell for employers that aren't providing support. And then the second bullet, having a disability or long-term health condition can un understandably exacerbate the impact of menopause symptoms of work and not, and not having that support in place as well. So a high percentage of people with a health condition or disability report a negative impact on career progression, a high percentage have left work or considered leaving work and so on. And then also across the board, individuals who um, feel unsupported at work by their employer, significantly more likely to report more pressure and more stress. And then moving down, last but one bullet, over half have been unable to go into work at some point due to their menopause symptoms. And that is not surprising given the number of symptoms that somebody can experience and also how debilitating some can be because we know around a quarter of those with symptoms experience really debilitating symptoms. And then finally, the final bullet here, almost three quarters felt unable to mention the menopause as the reason for them being unable to go into work. So they couldn't talk to their manager about the real reason. That must feel so isolating 
as well when you're experiencing these symptoms anyway to not actually feel the confidence or to feel comfortable that you work in an environment where you can actually be open about it as well on the next slide though i'm going to return now to the positive because here comes the opportunity we've had the gap here's the opportunity because what we can also see from our research what comes through so strongly and positively is the huge difference that workplace support can make to somebody with menopause symptoms. It reduces the impact of people's symptoms at work. It can reduce the pressure and stress that people feel. And it also has a positive impact on uh, people feeling able, able to progress their careers and not wanting to leave work. That has to be good for the employer as well, doesn't it? So, very strong business rationale for organisations to, to act, or, uh, act on this as well. They need all the valuable skills and talent they can get at the moment, as, as well as it just being the right thing to do. Then just want to very quickly on the next slide outline some valued types of support. Because we asked we asked employees, well, what support is in place, where it is in place? And then what would you most value? And I think the important thing to say up front is that there's not always alignment between what's on offer and what would be most valued. So organisations need to really engage with people and see what would be most valued, most helpful to help manage menopause symptoms. But here are the most valued. First of all, uh, planned flexible working. That was the top one. And let's remember to be creative around that because not everybody can work from home. It can be great if you can to manage symptoms, but we need to look beyond just hybrid and home working. Um, there are other flexible working opportunities that can help. Then ability to control local temperature, um, let last minute or unplanned late starts, and there's others as well. I think an important note as well is that small changes can make a big difference for people. Um, even just changing a shift pattern or being able to start a bit late because you had a terrible night. I've been in that situation countless times. Also, what's important is that support is um, kept under review because symptoms can really fluctuate. And following on from that, it's really important to tailor support to suit the individual because they're all experienced differently at different times. So. Ensuring that line managers eh, aren't embarrassed, can talk about menopause, also knows how to signpost and provide support um, is really important. That sensitive conversation is, is really um, a game changer in terms of discuss, being able to discuss your symptoms. And then the last slide is just returning to the point that I said I would do, which is around the importance of a healthy workplace culture. I've already mentioned this. Practical support is very important, but also the less tangible, uh, that wider climate, the environment. Can you talk about health issues generally? Can you talk about menopause specifically? And we've got the data to prove it as well in the survey, because when we asked those women with symptoms who did feel supported why they felt supported, it wasn't primarily because there was a policy there or even training or awareness. So all these things can play a part. But it was essentially because they felt that they worked in an environment where there was a healthy workplace culture. So really important to start talking about the menopause, open up the culture so that people can have conversations. And the role of colleagues has come through really strongly in this research as well. So it's really important, I think, to realise that we've all got a, a, a role to play, men too. This isn't just a female issue. So we've all we all play a part in creating that culture. So I'll, I'll leave that there. And Brilliant. And um, thank you so much, Rachel. I think that's a really insightful overview. Um, some really compelling, strong statistics there, but also I think um, evidence around actually how support can lessen some of the kind of the negative impact in the workplace around symptoms and how important it is. So um, really, really useful kickoff to our discussion. So thank you so much 
um, Rachel. So now I'd like to hand over to our second panellist, who is Helen Tomlinson, to hear about the work that she's been doing in her menopause employment champion role. I know she is incredibly busy uh, all the time, but particularly this month with Menopause Awareness Month, and also perhaps some of the initiatives she's put in place across the ADECO group as well. So over to you, Helen. Thank you, and thank you so much for inviting me um, here today. Um, so I'm just going to talk more broadly. I don't have um, a slide deck today, but I thought it would be really good to give an overview of um, the role, um, the what I'm doing in that role, um, and the impact that we hope that that will have on um, organisations. And I've just been making a few notes from the chat coming through in the questions and things. So I hope that I can cover some of those in this, but obviously we will come back to it. Um, so as Claire quite rightly said, um, my role is the government's menopause employment champion uh, role. I um, I took this role in uh, March of this year and I've just um, launched, I'm about to launch, I'm having it signed off by government, my six month report of what I've done in the first six months and what the plan is moving forward. So I'd be really happy to share that and I'm delighted that CIPD are one of my um, strategic partners who are amplifying the messaging. So I'm sure they will be happy to share that when that comes out. Um, as Claire also said, the role was at the request of the Women and Equality Select Committee that the government had somebody specifically focused on uh, menopause in the workplace and also at the request of the 50 plus uh, champions um, uh, DWP employment champions that somebody was focused on it so um, I hope that, that the work that I'm doing really resonates with those two groups that, that requested that the role be created. Um, I do have a, a, a day job as well, um, and I guess my, my day job kind of led into this role as well. So just to give you a little bit of history on that, um, I am the uh, Head of Talent and Inclusion at the ADECO Group. Uh, we are a, an HR um, and recruitment organisation, um, and I launched our menopause policy on World Menopause Day 2021 and as many organisations do or did thought it was a great thing to launch that policy and it absolutely was however in hindsight it was just the start it was all it was was the catalyst that started the conversation around education and allyship in the organisation that has created the cultural change. We know there's been cultural change. We're entirely data led um, in our organisation. Our data um, creates our strategy from, from a broader EDI perspective. And we know that the work that we've done around that has had an impact in the organisation. But I think the most important thing when you think about that is that was the first policy that we, we launched. We now call it guiding principles because we have one EDI policy and anything that sits beneath that is a guiding principle so we've been able to add to that on a multitude of topics over time but what that's done is broaden that conversation out for the organisation in a way that we could never have imagined. So yes, the policy is incredibly important, but it's only important because it creates that cultural, starts to create that cultural change. What is equally important on the back of it is the the manager training, the allyship training, the uh, champions programs, the safe space conversations um, that all come after that. And, and how you launch it is really important. You know, we did a series of podcasts with very senior leaders who were willing to talk about their menopause experience in the workplace, both the practical and the psychological aspects of it. And what that did was open up the conversation for people to say, that's me. I'm I'm struggling with that as well. And, you know, if somebody who looks like they've got it all together and they're doing a phenomenal job struggles with lack of confidence, anxiety, brain fog, heavy periods, whatever that particular aspect was, it, it normalised the conversation and it allowed those people in the organisation who were being medicated for, you know, depression and anxiety who actually won't, took the step to go back and see their GP and said, you know, I am from what I've read, from what I've seen, from the symptom checker that we provide, I am in perimenopause and I want to, you know, have the 
right support so a lot of a lot of great stuff came out of that and at the same time lobby i was lobbying government to get them to make it um a legal requirement to have a menopause policy uh, for organizations over 250 people and i started talking to carolyn harris um and um that that was really i started to talk to mps more broadly and that is how i came into this role so I'll just give you a little overview of what the strategy is for the um, it's called no time to step back. Um, and I firmly believe that the menopause um, experience, the transition is absolutely no time to step back in your career. We are losing women in leadership roles at the fastest rates ever, according to the McKinsey report of 2022, and they are not being placed by other female leaders. And that is a real issue um, and the, partly the reason for that is women are leaving because they are overworked, exhausted um, and they want to work for an organisation with more purpose. So you know, some of those things could be related to menopause, they could be related to the myriad of other things that midlife women have to um, have you know, going on, whether that caring responsibilities, whatever that looks like. But it is an issue because um, other f females coming through are not seeing those female role models and that it's a, so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. There are less and less female leaders. If you think about the fact that we're going to have to work much longer potentially, so we're in the workplace longer, um, you know, from a financial a pension perspective, it's really important. But also from a you know very personal perspective, if you've worked really hard to get to where you are, why should you step down, step back or step out of your career? And I've spoken to many women who felt that they have no choice but to do that. And the example that Rachel gave in the report was just one of many, many uh, women who feel like they've got no choice. Um, so the strategy is it's um, there's five aspects to it. So uh, focusing on five specific sectors um, and um, so they are manufacturing, retail, hospitality, care and professional and technical and um, looking at those and how we support um, women in those um, uh, sectors going through uh, menopause uh, to make sure that they have the best possible experience. Um, the second aspect of it is um, that we will have a four point plan. So the four point plan is as follows. The first aspect of that is that we will have best practice sharing and we kicked this off last week with um, a cross sector roundtable event at West Ham where we invited large organisations to share their best practice. Um, and the output of that is that all those organisations are willing to share their best practice with smaller organisations that may not have access, they may not have an HR team, they may not have the budget, they may not have an ED&I committee. So to make sure that they get the right support and those women who choose to work for SME organisations that make up 90% of the UK economy and three fifths of people work in the SME sector or are self-employed, um, to make sure they get access to all that best practice. It will all be free on the government's Help to Grow portal. And the reason that it's free is I am passionate about the fact that it has to be for everybody, regardless of the size of their organisation, regardless of their socioeconomic demographic, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of whether they have an HR department or not. So it's absolutely free for everybody. They will share their best practice and there will also we, there will also be guidance websites and all of that free resource on there that anybody can go to the second aspect of it is about the the isolation and the feeling that you've nobody to talk to and a lot of the many fantastic large employers that I've spoken to have got those allyship networks they've got those you know we have a hot topics coffee morning once a month we have an allyship program we have champions we have fully trained line managers we have you know, EAPs that we can uh, guide people to. But I've spoken to women who have literally nobody to talk to, nobody in the workplace, nobody um, you know, in their social circle. That could be because it, from an ethnicity perspective, they just quite simply 
don't have the um, the words for it. They don't culturally. They just don't talk about it. So they've nobody to talk to. So the National Allyship Program will be will link up uh, people in smaller organisations with counterparts in the same sector in large organisations who are doing good work. And what that will do is it will give people who are struggling somebody to talk to but it will also give line managers colleagues etc somebody to talk to in terms of how do I navigate this conversation how do I you know share that best practice so giving nobody should feel that they've nobody to reach out and talk to the third aspect of it is the menopause em uh, employer pledge um, and the reason that um, I'm passionate about that is because I feel that you know women need choices and the the whole of the no time to step back strategy isn't for competitive advantage and I'm delighted that all the employers that want to be part of it are willing to share what they're doing to better the experience of women everywhere so I think that's really important but women will make choices about where they where they want to work and the employers that they want to work for so if they can go to a, an employer who has signed a pledge or an accreditation that will give them better choices. It will also help to support the 630,000 women who are on universal credit between the ages of 45 and 55. It's really challenging. If you've been out of work for any period of time, for whatever the reason, it's really challenging coming back into the workplace. Overlay with that with the fact that you may have gone into perimenopause or menopause whilst you're um, out of the workplace, that can make it doubly hard. And I want women to be able to make good choices about the kind of employer they're going to work for. And the final aspect of it, of the strategy, is around the amplification. I am one person with another job. So I am delighted that I've got the buy-in from the key sector bodies for those five sectors. And I've also got my uh, partners, CIPD being one of them, who will absolutely support and champion the messaging to get more employers talking about women's health more broadly in the workplace. And I say women's health quite specifically because when I took the role, I started off just talking about men menopause as you know at, I think the world at large has really just started talking about perimenopause in the last two years so that's opening it up more broadly average age of perimenopause is 41 so it's opening up we've got five generations in our workforce I'm sure many of you have too but talking about women's health more broadly quite literally is from the day you start in an organization right through till that those um that day if you know you can retire when you're 67 as it stands at the moment for people my age um so it's more about women's health and that includes I saw somebody talking about uh, period management in the workplace in the chat and that allows us to talk more broadly because 44 percent of women struggle from heavy periods with with in perimenopause and menopause so you know that is something that anybody can find challenging and it's one of the toughest conversations to have with a line manager particularly if you're in a non-autonomous role so in addition to the strategy I'm thinking about the autonomous roles which can be great and I, I know that um, that was one of the aspects of so 67% of, of people surveyed in the CIPD survey said home or hybrid working would make it easier. Hybrid working, completely agree, but I found when I was home working, when I was perimenopausal, the anxiety, the loss of confidence, um, the you know that feeling of can I actually still do this job that was actually made worse by working from home so the 67% of women that said the psychological symptoms were difficult to deal with it's also I felt that they were exacerbated being isolated working in an autonomous role but then there are the non-autonomous roles where you've literally no choice but to show up and again that can be very challenging both from a psychological perspective but also a very practical perspective um, and the, the final thing that I just wanted to touch on that's underpinning my strategies around it's not just it's for everybody 
absolutely everybody is impacted by it, whether they realize that or not. 51% of the population will go through it. Women over 50 are the fastest growing demographic in the workplace. But I was at two key, really key sessions a couple of weeks ago. One was at a manufacturing um, place place or the right word but a manufacturing site it's huge and they were talking about some of their um people on the manufacturing line very male dominated but one of the uh, team had come into work and said um i don't feel that i can operate heavy machinery today i've been awake all night my wife is really struggling with insomnia night sweats we haven't got a spare room she can sleep in because we've got you know children in the other rooms. I don't feel like I should be operating heavy machinery. But he felt he had the psychological safe space to come in and be able to say that. And I was at the uh, working with the police force last week as well, and they said they got a firearms officer who pretty much said the same thing. Should I be used in charge of a firearm when I haven't had any sleep because of that? that experience so it's not just thinking about women in the workplace and people who experience menopause and obviously andropause from a male perspective it's about how that impacts on the other people around them both in and out of the workplace so when the report is signed off it will be launched and the overview of the strategy will be in there but if any employer is interested in being part of the working parties that will support and I've met some incredible people and um, the net one of them is coming up next to talk about what they're doing in their organization um, but it's so good to have so many employers willing to share to make the experience better for people in the workplace more broadly. So thank you. Um, and, you know, I hope that's given you some insight um, and I, I really hope you'll follow and support on that journey. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Helen. We can um, we can feel your enthusiasm oozing through all of the things that you were saying and some really nice comments um, in the chat around how refreshing it is that you're, you know, focusing on specific sectors and also SMEs as well, who often kind of feel a bit neglected in the conversation. Um, so many thanks for that. I'm really excited to hear about your strategy. So I'd like to now hand over to our third and final panellist, Angie Voidless, to hear all about the work that's happening at your organisation, Associated British Foods. Um, and I know that you kind of take an international approach as well. So I'm sure we've got lots of international organisations here that will be interested as part of the webinar. So just really looking forward to hearing from you. Over to you, Angie. Thank you, Claire. Can you hear me OK? OK. Um, hello everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know much about uh, Associated British Foods, I wanted to start by providing an overview because I think that the context is really key. So could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so this is us. Uh, we're an international food ingredients and retail business. Uh, we've got about 132,000 employees globally. Um, and as you can see, we've got customers in over 100 countries, but we operate in 53. Um, our group headquarters is in the UK and actually most of the work that we've done to date around menopause support has been in the UK, but we are starting to do more internationally. But a really key thing for us is that we have a devolved operating model. So what this means in practice is that our businesses set objectives from the bottom up rather than the top down um, and any operational decisions are made locally by uh, leaders who have knowledge, specific knowledge of the business and of their people. Um, I work in the head office. Um, and amongst many things that the head office does, it's there to provide strategic level insight, but support collaboration and enable sustainable business practices. So all the while we're trying to learn from one another and share the good practices around the world. Um, in terms of the UK context, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we have a whole range of businesses. We have small, medium, large. Um, they are in various different industries, as you can see there, from grocery, sugar, agriculture, ingredients and retail. And therefore, the environment that our people work in is very, very different. Um, the business sizes also mean that we have varying um, approaches that we need to take, varying budgets that are available. Um, hopefully you recognise some of the brands up there. Um, but the the context, I think, as uh, Helen was alluding to in, in a manufacturing plant, that's very, very different to our retail stores in Primark, for example. Um, and therefore, we've had to take quite a wide 
mix, uh, a wide ranging mix of approaches in order to be more supportive towards individuals in these different environments. Um, so if we move on to look at the context that exists, thank you. Um, I, I've put up some of the things there that we've been considering when we're thinking about how we can be more supportive, um, because when you're experiencing symptoms, the environment that you're working in, the location that you're at, the working patterns can have a really big fact, um, in, really big impact on that. So to, to give you some of the extremes um, in terms of locations, we have some people who are based physically at a site or maybe a couple of sites, um, or possibly they have a mix of home working and on site working. And then we have those out in the field. So they're going around to customers, consumers, out and about, driving around, um, never in the same location day on, day out. Um, the environment can be very different as well. You know, one extreme we have clean room laboratories, which are climate controlled, regulated access. Um, we also have people operating heavy machinery. We have drivers in uniforms, people on production lines in full PPE. Um, they might be out at community events. And we also have people working in offices and hybrid working like myself at home. So the actual physical environment can be quite different too. Um, we also have a mix of working patterns as a business does. So some have the very autonomous roles that Helen alluded to with that flexibility. I can take a break when I want to. If I need to step away from business, uh, from my work, I, my laptop, I can do. Um, if I wanted to start a little bit later because I've had a rough night's sleep, I'm able to do that. But many, many colleagues do not are not able to do that, um, either because they need to be at a specific place of work or because they're on a shift pattern. They're part of a team that's working together so that um, flexibility really varies. Um, and then finally, one really key point is around the um, awareness and the access to resources. So. Um, some people like myself um, have got computers, mobile phones, you know, very easy to access information and support at the touch of a finger. If I compare that to our colleagues who are operating machinery, um, they don't have their own work device. Um, we often have shared devices on our site, so there'll be a group login so people can have a look at the apps and information on our businesses. Um, but they don't have a, their own work device. So increasingly we're having to find a way to provide people with access to their own personal device. Um, so overall, really different context, uh, which means across all of our businesses, we've had to take quite a wide range of approaches. So the next slide outlines some of the things we've done. Um, and what I really wanted to emphasize is not every business in ABF has done all of these things. <laughs> so what I've done is consolidate and pull it all together, but this by no means is everyone doing everything. Um, and also, you know, some of them have been working on it for a few years, others it's more recent. Um, so working away across the top, um, we've asked people, you know, we, we're aware um, personal experiences change, they're very different between people, but also they shift over time. So understanding what people need at that point in time and being flexible to adapt to that is really key. We've done discussion groups, but we've also done surveys as well to try and understand what's most important, what they will really value. Um, we've run training, the more formal training that's been instructor led, and we've had e-learning as well, so people can dip in and out of it and access information when they need it. Um, we've done knowledge sharing events with internal and external speakers, sharing articles and resources. Um, we've also looked at our policies and our processes. Um, so you just recognising if we want to be inclusive around this, um, acknowledging that it's um, a lot of the research refers to women specifically, but we want to acknowledge that it's also non-binary people, transgender people. Um, a lot of the imagery tends to focus on um, white women historically in the past. Um, we wanted to make sure that it is inclusive of all women. So we've been looking at that as well. And also thinking about um, introducing, or we have in one business introduced um, absence um, around menopause being a reason for absence. But that's, you know, not just switching on a box in a system that requires comms around it. So it's, it's looking more holistically at that. Um, we've also, where we have wellbeing providers who give us apps, EAP, counselling and so on, um, really tapped into the resources that they provide specifically around menopause and making people aware that that support is available too. Um, encouraging conversations has been really key. So running support groups, either mixed groups, 
um, for those experiencing symptoms only, um, partner sessions we've done as well, and also providing guidance to line managers so that they can have uh, an effective and open conversation and create that very um, uh, open culture where people feel able to share without being fearful of the consequences has been really important. Um, and then uh, with the others, we've done media clubs, share what books you've read, films you've seen, TV programmes, podcasts, anything like that that's been really helpful. Um, looking at uh, fabrics that we've got for PPE, so making sure they're breathable fabrics. Um, and then finally, looking at supplies. So in our bathrooms and washrooms, making sure that there are sanitary and hygiene products, um, as well as looking at ventilation and providing people with fans where practically it's able to do so. Um, and then the final thing is uh, we are members of Hempicked, so working towards being a men menopause friendly accreditation and a lot of their resources have supported us in providing that. And um, so just to finish, I was going to provide some things we've learnt along the way. <laughs> um, I think the, the key things there, you can read the, the key points of the slide, but the ones I really wanted to pick out for is to ask people rather than assume. Um, you know, that's been our key learning rather than trying to meet the needs of everyone en masse is to look at people individually and be really key, uh, be really tailored to what you're providing. Um, using multiple media formats, different locations, different ways of communicating information is key and keep on with the messaging. So people, people hear things, but they need to keep hearing it to understand what support is available. Um, we focused on the needs of our audiences, so, you know, materials for line manager, slightly different pitch for those for individuals. Those safe spaces have been really, really key. So making sure it's OK to ask questions, it's OK to sometimes say the wrong thing if that's a learning experience. Um, but confidential spaces have been really important. Um, engaging with everyone, so not just line managers, colleagues can be just as supportive on a day to day basis. Um, and then really aligning with the business context, the tone, the formality, so it feels like something that's regarded on equal value as everything else. Um, and then the last two points about key people, so role models who share their stories, give people the, um, the power to share their own experiences, and particularly when it comes from a senior level, that senior level sponsorship just makes sure that time, money and resources are given towards this. I'll hand back to you, Claire, now for questions. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, Andy. I think like a really great overview there of all of the things that you're doing. Um, so practical and really great to hear about, you know, what you're doing to support frontline staff that need to be in the physical um, workspace. So important. We have literally had loads of questions, so uh, we're going to get through as many as we can. And I'm going to try to pull out some kind of broad themes that I can see coming through um, in the in the uh, Q&A. Um, so I think if I may, Helen, I'm going to go to you first. And we had quite an early question around whether we are aware of any information or likelihood of support by the government for menopause leave coming through in any of the conversations that you've had. And this is an organisation that's, you know, wanting to be prepared and, you know, ahead, I think, around these sorts of things. Sorry, I dutifully put myself on mute. Um, I, I haven't had any conversations around menopause leave yet. I guess the uh, you know, a lot of organisations are handling that in their own way as part of their what they choose to do as best practice. But, you know, if you as a straight answer, I haven't had any conversations that isn't necessarily my remit, but I haven't heard anything. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, there's a couple of uh, tactical questions from people, so we could cover off a few of those with you now. Um, so some people asking around how you access the Help to Grow site. Um, you talked about the allyship programme, how people could yeah. access that. And then there was also a question around whether you could provide any more information around the symptom checker that you mentioned. So just a, Absolutely. a few things. Yep, so I did drop in the chat that the Help to Grow portal exists now, but it hasn't. So we are adding to what already exists from oh, a perfect. menopause perspective and it won't go live until after World Menopause Day, simply because we're at the moment we're in the process of working with the employers to create collate all the information and the best practice and then the again the allyship program we're working with a provider who's got the tech 
platform who will be able to help us to host that so that will I've committed that that will go live for International Women's Day uh, because of the tech aspect of it isn't quite as easy as I <laughs> naively assumed it would be um so yeah so they are part of I was just giving you oversight of what it is what's in my report from my first six months of the future plan so they will come out soon and in terms of the symptom checker the one that we've got is one that I created for um, a deco but there is I often recommend and I'm really happy to share that with anybody who wants to see it um, I often recommend the balance app which is a free app um, that allows you to get support track your symptoms in order to be able to start a conversation whether that be with your line manager your GP or with a partner friends relative etc um, the paper one that we created or the online one that we created at ADECO does exactly the same thing the balance app is just way more sophisticated brilliant oh thank you so much Helen uh, Rachel we're going to come across to you we've had a question around some of the um, examples of some of the interventions which are seen as best practice and I know we talk about our our kind of four pillars at, at the CIPD, Rachel. So I wondered whether you wanted to give a bit more information around those potentially. Yeah, so on our website is guidance for people professionals and line managers. So I think a lot of people might find those helpful if you want more detail of the kind of where do you start? What kind of framework do you develop? Um, who should be responsible for what? And we do have, as Claire said, the these pillars and it's a really useful sort of framework to look at and I think first of all it really is around the culture and starting a conversation I think you can be surprised at how quickly things can open up we've had that at CIPD as well once you start talking things can really snowball and it's a relief for so many people to be able to talk about menopause so opening up the conversation is a really good place to start but then you do need as a people professional to look at what policies and health support you already provide and see is it helpful for people around menopause and do we need more explicit support and how do we involve people along that journey rather than just imposing so what about menopause champions do you have well-being champions already and then look at how you manage absence there's a question that's come in around absence um, it needs to be flexible. No, it's not helpful to have a trigger system. Really, the guiding principle is to be fair and compassionate and, and flexible. But obviously, line managers need to feel confident about not applying a trigger system as well. So it's getting that balance of fairness and consistency, but meeting people's individual needs. Some people have found it helpful to have a, a well-being passport um to to outline what their symptoms are and then what support can be helpful what adjustments we've got a very helpful list on our website of the most common symptoms and the kind of changes and adjustments that could be most helpful for managing those but it is that conversation with the individual that really needs to be the centerpiece of all this because what's helpful for one person won't be helpful for another Absolutely. Thanks so much, Rachel. And Angie, if I could come across to you, because I, I know that you were talking about this as part of your, your slide. Um, I think it was your final slide. And someone was just asking about, you know, how do you introduce um, a structure around having that safe conversation in the workplace? Do you have any sort of tips that you could give about the approach that you've made around, you know, creating a safe space to talk about menopause and health issues, for instance? Mm. Yeah, um, so we've done it in different ways with the line managers. We've given them guidance about think about where you're having the conversation. It's not just about what you ask and how you open that up. But, you know, are you in a quiet area where you're not going to be overheard or interrupted, just as you would for any kind of confidential conversation? And then we've given them information so that they have some understanding. They can build their empathy towards the individual sharing experiences. And we've given line managers the information about where to go, what support is available so they can signpost people. We're not expecting them to be the experts but we've just enabled them to open up the conversation. Um, oh, when brilliant. it comes to, to the, the group sessions is a bit different. So that's just been about raising awareness and positioning it as a safe space. So slightly different context there. 
Brilliant, but really incredibly helpful, I think. So thank you so much, Angie. Um, there was a question, and I think um, Helen's alluded to it already, but about, you know, should we, broad should, should we be broadening the conversation to talk about women's health generally and talk about menstrual health support in the workplace? And I know um, Rachel and I will be launching some work around menstrual health and having that wider conversation. I just wondered whether anyone would like to um, come in on that point. Helen, do you want to go? Okay, Helen and then Rachel, shall we? I can see both yeah. looking very keen. Ab absolutely, and I think I think it's it just it makes total sense. And I actually wish that I'd launched a women's health policy or launched all of it um when i launched our menopause policy and it was just the fact that um it was coming up to world menopause day i just joined our gender forum and we started that that topic what i would say is launching the topic of menopause in the workplace for us opened up the the floor for us to talk about other topics and very shortly after that i did um a session internally called bloody hell we're talking about periods and, and if I'm really honest had we not started talking about menopause I'm not sure the organization would have been quite ready for that so it it mm. made sense at the time but actually it would have been better to start talking about the the whole of the the women's health strategy right from from the word go and I was on a, a webinar earlier with a lady who was talking about the you know the girl talk in school and the fact that you know it's that could, the journey starts the first day when you're taken you know the girls the boys are sent out to do football the girls are taken into a classroom to talk about periods and they're given you know a, a packet of Dr White's or whatever they were back in the day and that's when that conversation starts and actually to not include all the stages is a, I think a real oversight so we probably need to reverse engineer it and include that com that whole conversation in the workplace so that's what I'm I'm starting to do more broadly now. Brilliant thanks Helen. Rachel? Yeah I couldn't agree with Helen more and I think we've had a similar sort of dawning realisation as well at CIPD and I think the work over the last five years that we've been doing on the menopause and others as well um, has really helped to raise awareness around the need for this other huge gaping gap, which is around support and being able to talk even around mm -hmm. menstruation and menstrual health as well. Another completely natural life issue, mm -hmm. but we really need to um, raise momentum and awareness you know quite urgently around this and as Claire said next month we'll be publishing guidance and more research around that but I've already got one finding to flag which just shows how much we do need this work um, when I mentioned that 46 percent now of organizations have got uh menopause on their health and well-being radar they've got a framework they've got something in place the comparable figure around menstrual health is 17%. So we've mm. got a bit of a mountain. Much lower. But really what we want is exactly what you said, is that holistic approach to health and then women's health as well. Absolutely. So really glad that came up. Well, brilliant. I, I hate to say that we're at the end of our session because we could keep on going and we've had some excellent questions and, and thank you so much to our amazing panellists. So a big thank you to Rachel, to Helen and to Angie and also to all of you for tuning in, for watching, for your engagement and your questions. Um, we really do um, appreciate it. Um, and then finally, just to say again, don't forget the CIPD's wellbeing support for members in the UK and Ireland um, and the free 24-7 telephone helpline staffed by qualified therapists. Um, so thank you to everyone. Uh, a really great session and let's keep building um, awareness and support within our workplaces um, around women's health and around the issues that we've been talking about specifically today, um, menopause as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, everybody.